Okay, here we go. 17 and 18, and then we'll be halfway through the book. Buddy. Chapter 17. I wish it wouldn't happen, but it always does. No matter what, along comes August, and off we go to school. I don't see J-Boy anywhere, so I don't have to worry about him anymore. Now it's that boy Rusty sitting next to me instead. I tell him I have a dog, and he says he wishes he had one, and I say, why don't you come by my house some day and see mine? And he says, okay. I ask him what he does like, I ask him does he like to draw, and he shrugs his shoulders and says, maybe. I've been in school only a week when Daddy comes home from work Saturday evening and Grandpa T meets him on the steps. Did you hear about this storm? Grandpa T says. What kind of storm? Daddy says. It's a hurricane, Grandpa T says. They call it Katrina. They say it's a bad one. They're all bad, Daddy says. The mayor says we ought to leave, Grandpa T says. He always says that, Daddy says. Remember last time? Last time we didn't have baby Terrell yet. He was still just a big old bump in Mama's stomach. Last time when the mayor said, get out of town, we all piled in the car and drove to Mississippi where Grandpa T's people stayed. Aunt Joyce, Grandpa T's niece, let us stay in the spare room in her house. Mom and Daddy, me and Tanya and Grandpa T, all in the same room. We were all sound asleep when Mama started moaning in the middle of the night. Daddy said, oh, Lord. And pretty soon the whole house was awake except Grandpa T, and he was doing all, and he was doing his going away trick that ain't really sleeping. By morning we had a baby brother in the storm was somewhere in North Alabama. Daddy said we got to go home because he's got to work and I got to go to school. So we left Mom and Tanya and the baby in Mississippi with Aunt Joyce, and got on the road with everybody else, everybody in the whole city of New Orleans trying to give back. The sky was bluer than I'd ever seen, and the sun was so hot I thought I, it was going to make the paint curl up off the roof of the car. I remember last time, Grandpa T says, and all I can say is, thank the Lord she ain't pregnant again. I mean, the way everybody get, got all excited, Daddy says, and then nothing happened. Those storms don't hit New Orleans. They always turn at the end. Don't let the devil hear you say that, Grandpa T said. And he goes inside. Sunday morning we go to church and the preacher looks at me and says, I heard about what that dog did. I say, he's a good dog, Brother James. He takes care of things. He's walking real good now. He even climbs up a few steps. I'm going to make him a pirate leg, and he'll do even better. You're the instrument of God, Brother James says. God was waiting for your car so that dog could have a happy life. With only three legs, I say. There's always a price, Brother James says, and shakes his head. Happiness always comes with a price. When he calls us to prayer, he talks about Buddy. He talks about how everybody came together and saved God's creature, and how helping each other is what God meant us to do. And then he starts praying louder. He raises up his voice and he says, a storm is coming, Lord. A storm is coming. At first, I think he's talking about evil as usual. But this time, he's talking about rain and wind. The mayor came on the TV this morning, Brother James prays. He came on the TV and he said, You got to leave. He said, It's mandatory. And Lord... What does mandatory mean? It means you got to, Lord. We got to leave our homes. Lord, there's some of us who have a way. 
we've got cars or we got people we who've got cars lord give us the strength to gather our families and put them in the cars and take them to safety but lord there's some of us who don't have a way some of us are too old, and some of us are too young, and some of us are too poor. Lord, help us to reach out to our brothers and sisters who don't have a way. Help us to put them in our cars with us. Help us to take them to the Superdome if they need a ride. Help us, Lord, to help each other, just like we helped old buddy. So we can gather again next Sunday and raise our voices in praise and joy just like we're doing today. Hallelujah. And the choir starts singing and Mama casts her eye on Daddy. And Daddy looks back at her and raises up his eyebrows. And I know we're leaving again. Mama starts packing the minute, minute we get home. She starts with baby Terrell's stuff. She pulls out all his diapers and bottles and toys and stroller and poor crib. And then Daddy says, we can't take all that, woman. And Mama makes a face like she's sucking a lemon. But she puts back the toys and the stroller and the poor crib. Who are we going to take with us, I say to her, like Brother James says. Mama stops stuffing a bag and looks at me. You ain't got the sense you were born with, boy. Where are we going to put somebody else? Tie them to the roof? She shakes her head and snatches up baby Terrell right before he pulls over the lamp. Get a suitcase, she says. Pack two nights of clothes. Help Tanya tack, pack two. Daddy's in the kitchen filling up a cooler, and Grandpa T's shifting around in his room, putting things in a paper sack. Maybe we ought to take Miss Washington to the Superdome, I say to him. We'd have to drag her out, Grandpa T says. And anyway, how's she going to make do with all those strangers and she's half blind? He sets his sack on the table, and I look inside. There's a box of pictures, his Bible his pills, and two pair of undershorts. You're packing light, I say. We ain't going to be gone long. Tanya's sitting on the sofa with her doll, about to cry. Do what your mama told you to do, Grandpa T says. Go help your sister pack. So I drag Tanya upstairs and make her pick out some clothes. We're fighting about whether she can pack her ballerina skirt and those little red shoes when I hear Dad calling me. Lil T, he's yelling, go get Buddy and bring him inside. I go running down the stairs. Why inside, I say. Can't leave him outside, Daddy says. Leave, I say. We can't take Buddy with us, Daddy says. There ain't room in the car. All of a sudden, I can't move. I'm standing there like a statue. My fingertips are throbbing and my feet feel like rocks. Then I won't go, I say. Daddy stops still and stares at me. I'll stay here with Buddy. I look after the house. Y'all won't be gone long. Maybe I'll go stay with Miss Washington. I said, bring Buddy inside. Daddy's looking at me like he's one inch away from getting that stick up by the shed. Now, he says, turns around and walks off. I go outside and Buddy's laying on his blanket. He lifts up his nose when he sees me and his tail goes thump. I sit down and rest my elbows on my knees. Then I bend down my head and hold it in my two hands. I ain't touching Buddy or even looking at him. But I can feel him. It's like the whole shed is filled up with him being there. He moves his feet and his claws scratch a little on the floor. His tail thumps against the wall and I hear him breathing. Not panting, but not real quiet either. I know the tip of his tongue is hanging out the side of his mouth. 
I know his whole body is moving just the slightest bit with each breath. Then I hear his teeth click together when he closes his mouth and the rustle of the blanket as he lays his head down. I know he's looking at me with his big, soft eyes, just like he always does. I can't leave Buddy. I can't not leave Buddy. I lift up my head, and I see his eyes turned up to look at me. He waits a second, then he gets up and limps over to where I'm sitting. He pokes his nose at my hand where it's holding up my head. He licks my ear. I know they're all running around like crazy inside. I know I could just walk out the gate and Buddy would follow me and they wouldn't ever see. I could go wherever I wanted. We could go find a shed somewhere and hide. I'd take his blanket and at night we'd sleep on it together. When I was sure everybody was gone, we'd sneak back. His food and his bowls would be beaten. I'd break in the house and make soup. Once the storm passed, I'd check on Miss Washington and make sure she was okay. I'd bring her some of the soup. Buddy would lay down on her front porch, and we'd sit in her, in her swing, and she'd give me cold drink, and I'd read her letters to her, and maybe I'd cut her grass for free. When I came back home, I'd go up on the roof and fix a hole where a pecan branch broke off in the storm. Now Buddy's licking my cheek like it's a popsicle. I take his face in my hands, and he licks my whole face. When, we, when they got home, the house would be fixed. Miss Washington would be safe, and they'd say, All of a sudden, Grandpa T shows up at the door. You coming, son? He says. I can't leave Buddy, I say, and a little hiccup comes out. Grandpa T sits down beside me. Why do you love that ugly old dog so much? I just do. I love my chicken. Grandpa T's rubbing my back. Can you imagine that? Loving a chicken. I don't say nothing. Grandpa T stands up. You ain't got no choice, son, he says. I'll carry the dog food. He grabs up the bag and heads toward the house. I don't move. He turns around. We're all waiting, he says, and goes on inside. I stand up and lead Buddy out of the shed. He's following me, but his tail ain't wagging. Two days, I'm telling him. It's only two days. He stops still at the bottom of the steps. You can do it, I say. You're strong enough. He hops up the steps one at a time. I hold the door open for him. It's the first time he's ever been inside. He bends down and starts sniffing at the rug like he ain't sure this is where he's supposed to be. I don't like a dog in my house, Mama says. It ain't your house, Grandpa T says. We're putting him in the big bathroom upstairs, Daddy says. We'll shut him up. It's hard for Buddy to make it up the stairs. Finally, Daddy reaches down and picks him up. He's a lot heavier, Daddy says. You're feeding him too much. We're all standing in the bathroom. Buddy's walking around, sniffing at the corners and poking his nose at the trash can. Grandpa T's running the bathtub full of water. Daddy's setting up the food bag in the corner and cutting a hole in the bottom so Buddy can eat straight out the bag. Where's he going to pee, Daddy, I say. Where's he going to do his business? He'll figure it out, Daddy says. Then Buddy starts kind of running around the bathroom in little circles. He's making whimpery sounds. His tail's going down between his hind legs. He knows we're leaving him. He knows what it feels like. Grandpa T turns off the water, and Buddy runs over and licks out a little. He's got enough water to last forever, it looks like. He runs over and takes a bite of his food. He comes over and pokes his nose at my hand. His big old brown eyes are looking up at me like he's wondering if this is for true. Like he can't believe I'd do this to him. I start toward the door and he's right beside me. He's glued up so close I'm almost tripping on him. Make him stay, Daddy says. I walk to the back of the bathroom and Buddy walks with me. Sit, Buddy, I say, and he sits. Stay, I say, and start backing up toward the door. All of a sudden, Daddy grabs my arm, snatches me out the room.
Daddy slams the door, and we hear Buddy running across the tile. Then we hear him scratching on the door. You don't have to paint that door when we get back, Daddy says. Then Buddy starts to howl. I ain't never heard that sound before. Oh! Buddy's crying. Oh! I put my hand on the door and feel it shaking. Buddy, I say. But he keeps on wailing and moaning, like he ain't never heard me, like he ain't even never even known me. I'm standing there, and somebody big's trying to go down my throat. Oh, I'm standing there, and something big's trying to go down my throat. I'm feeling my eyes get stingy, and Buddy keeps on howling. Two days, I say to Daddy. Two days, Daddy says. That's the end of chapter 17. Chapter 18 it usually takes an hour and a half to get to Aunt Joyce's place in Mississippi. This time, it takes eight. We're sitting on the superhighway with everybody and his brother. The cars are backed up along the road as far as you can see, all shining in the hot sun. When we're on the bridge crossing Lake Ponch train, some cars start driving down the shoulder lane and Daddy starts cussing. Mom says, T. Junior, that doesn't help, and he shuts up. It takes us four hours just to get from our house to the other side of that bridge. Once we get across the lake, I see a man getting out of the passenger door of a car and walk along the side of the road for a while. He bends down, touches his toes a few times, and does some jumping jacks. Then he turns around and goes back to his car. Traffic is moving. That's love. Baby Terrell starts fussing, and Grandpa T's got his head tilted back as usual. Tanya's singing to herself in the back seat. After a while, Mama starts up some hymns. I wish I had my Game Boy back. <coughs> Eight hours is a long time to sit in a car that ain't hardly moving. We make Aunt Joyce's house long after dark. She's got a whole plate of fried chicken waiting in a big old pot of gumbo. We eat and we talk. I tell Aunt Joyce all about Buddy. She says she had a dog once. She named him Spot because he had a white circle around one eye. He had four legs but lost part of his ear in a fight. Aunt Joyce can't remember what Kate became a Spot. She says she'd have to ask her mama in her mama's past. Daddy and Grandpa T sit out on the front porch and drink their beer. They don't have any neighbors to talk to because we're so far out in the country. There ain't no other houses. There ain't no cars. There ain't no lights. Tanya's running around in the dark trying to catch fireflies while Aunt Joyce looks for a jar. Mama's sitting on the swing, holding baby Terrell and humming. I walk out into the open yard where Aunt Joyce has a little garden growing tomatoes. At home, you have to lift the tomatoes up to your nose and give them a good sniff if you want to smell them. Here, they soak up the sun all day and then sit there in the dark, sending off their tomato smell to everybody in the yard. I get myself a good nose full and then walk farther out under the trees. Hey, Joyce must have fifty trees in her yard. They're tall, tall pine trees. I got to bend my head way back to see the needles fall at the top. The wind is moving them just the tiniest bit, and they're making a quiet whoosh, whoosh. Sound. I can see lots of stars through the trees, but I can see the clouds are starting to blow in, too. When I get back to the porch, Daddy and Grandpa T are looking up. They're feeling the air. It's coming, Grandpa T says. I'll be glad when it's gone, Mama says. I already want to lie down in my own bed. I hear her voice in the dark, and I think how quiet it is at home right now with everybody gone. How quiet 
and dark. I'm wondering what Buddy is thinking. I'm wondering if he's scared. I wrinkle up my forehead and I squinch my eyes shut and I send him a message. Two days, Buddy. I think. Just wait. Two days. When I wake up Monday morning, I'm covered in sweat. We're all sleeping in the same room again. Mom and Daddy are on the bed. Grandpa T is on a sofa pushed against the wall. Baby Terrell's in a crib borrowed from the people down the road. Me and Tanya are rolled up in blankets on the floor. <clears throat> the ceiling fan ain't moving, and there ain't no air coming out the vents. The alarm clock is dead, and the storm is on us. I'm laying there sweating and listening to the wind. I ain't never heard wind like that before. It sounds like a ship on the river and a cat screaming and a whistle blowing all at the same time. And it don't stop. It just keeps on going. On and on and on. The pipes in the walls are rattling, and the glass in the windows is shaking. The curtains are blowing in and out, even though the windows are locked shut. Every once in a while, the rain slams against the windows like somebody threw a bucket of gravel straight at the glass. I hear footsteps. It's Mama. She's tippy-toeing across the room. She pulls baby Terrell out of the crib. He's so asleep, he almost flops out of her arms. She takes him in the bed with her. I see her crawling under the covers and tucking baby Trill up between her and Daddy. I feel Tanya next to me. In the dark, I can barely see her eyes shining at me, wide open and still. Don't be scared, I whisper and pull her closer. Underneath all the sounds of the wind, there is a howling sound. A howling sound like Buddy's. I'm laying there with Tanya all snugged up next to me, and I feel like I can hear him. All the way in New Orleans. He's sitting on that cold floor. That old house is shaking, and he's here in the wind just like I am. He's tilting his head back. His mouth is opening up, and out comes that sound. You left me, little T, he's saying. And all the sadness in his heart is just pouring out in that little bitty bathroom, all by himself. I'm squinching up my eyes, trying to send him a message. Be brave, buddy, I'm saying. Be brave. And then all of a sudden, something outside explodes, loud, like a bomb's been dropped. And again... And again, and again, I hear Mama's voice praying. She's praying almost as loud as the wind, but I can't make out her words. And then Daddy's bending down beside us and saying, Everybody's under the bed, and we're all crowding up under where it's dusty, and they're, Everybody under the bed, and we're all crowding up under where it's dusty, and they're probably spiders. But we ain't thinking about that. Daddy's head is up beside me, and I whisper in his ear, What's that sound, Daddy? The trees, Daddy says. All those pine trees are popping in, too. We lay under the bed and listen. One after the other, the trees explode, and we hear the sound of the branches breaking as they crash past each other onto the ground, and then they hit. Sometimes the whole house bounces, and somewhere in the house we hear glass shatter. We always hear that wind blowing and screaming and howling. And now I'm thinking about the window in our bathroom and the pecan tree beside our house. And my mind is so tight with pictures I can't send any more messages to Buddy. We're laying there so long I forgot there's any other place to be. I forget my name's Lil T. 
It's almost like being asleep, except it's completely different. I feel Daddy beside me. Sometimes he's stiff. Sometimes he's praying. When I remember, I say my prayers, too. And I cross my fingers, just in case. When it's finally quiet, we creep out from under the bed. Grandpa T's so stiff he can't hardly move. Mama's got dust balls in her hair. Tanya's practically sucked her thumb off her hand. And baby Trill needs a diaper real bad. We find Aunt Joyce locked in her bathroom. Daddy gets her to come out. All together we open the front door and look out into the drippy morning sun. All the pine trees in her yard are down. Every single one. And the air smells sparkly clean. Sparkly and clean, like a Christmas tree lot. The electricity pole is broken too, and half is laying on the ground. One little tree is leaning on the roof of the front porch. All the other trees between the house and the road are snapped and cracked and blocking the driveway. Our car is crushed, and Aunt Joyce's car is pinned in between two tree trunks twice as big around as a utility pole. We ain't going nowhere soon, Grandpa T says. Aunt Joyce bends down and picks up something laying on the front porch. It's a shingle. Then I see the yard is full of them. She sighs. We don't have any electricity, she says. Don't open the refrigerator unless you have to. We'll fire up the grill to cook. The rescue trucks will come soon. I'll look at Daddy. You said two days. He looks back at me. What do you want me to do about it, he says and goes to clomping out on the for porch to sit. And that's the end of chapter 18. And we are halfway through the book. And I don't know about you, but Hurricane Katrina was one of the most devastating storms in the history of the Gulf Coast, save probably the Galveston hurricane in the 1900s. Millions of people were displaced from their homes. Millions of people didn't even have any homes to go home to when they could go home which was six months to a year later. A lot of people from Louisiana moved to Texas and to the neighboring states. And it was very, very sad in the history of our country. Those that survived, those that got out and survived, survived. They were the safe ones. Those who chose to stay, most did not last. They did not survive. New Orleans is now Rebuilding. But her pride has been broken. Until next time, may the Lord bless and keep you. May He make His face shine on you and be
gracious to you. May the Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace and give you